right. We should be. Yep, we're on. Okay, so let me let everyone in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our RAG workshop. Um, we've got three good speakers here today. And let's start with Andre. Uh, Go ahead. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, it sounds like a very good uh, lineup that we've got in place. Um, three good talks. Hopefully, um, the talk that I'm giving will be a primer to to Rag and hopefully sets the table for for Lance and Harpreet in their talks. Um, so my talk is on uh, basically introduction to Rag. So hopefully, it does set the table. Um, the agenda for my talk are, are three items. Um, one is the motivation. So why do we need RAG? Or uh, I should, I apologize. RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, and, and from here on out, I'll be calling it RAG. But so why do we need RAG in the first section of the talk? Second, we'll go into basic RAG, which involves you know essentially three high level steps. And I'll walk you through a demo build I am a founding software engineer at Llama Index. So the code that I'll be presenting uh, throughout this notebook utilizes Llama Index. And then lastly, you know, I'll just have some discussion points about moving beyond basic reg um, and perhaps touch on a little bit of, of you know, hints to the evaluation as well as uh, context stuff. But that's the agenda for today. So why don't we get started? So essentially I just need to go through um, some notebook setup stuff. So here I'm just installing Llama Index. This is actually already installed. Um, I'll have some async tasks. So I need to get uh, you know an event loop running in the background. And then the document that we'll be um, querying over is a document uh, regarding Vector Institute, which is a research institute here in um, Canada, where I am from, uh, but more on that uh, shortly. So this is just some setup stuff here for the notebook. Okay, so motivation. Why is it that we need RAG? Um, okay, so we know, uh, hopefully most of us know here by now that LLMs are quite powerful tools, uh, able to do a lot of things, you know, from data extraction to, you know, generating texts and, and many others. Um, but we do know that there are some drawbacks to LLMs, namely LLMs can suffer from hallucinations, um, you know, the fact that the LLMs are trained on static data means that some of the relevant information that you might be asking or prompting the LLM might be beyond the scope of the training corpus. And so you won't get accurate responses. And then, you know, related to that, the LLMs don't really have access to the latest information. And so, uh, asking an LLM uh, questions about updated documents uh, are probably not going to bode too well. And so in this image here, uh, I'm just showing you essentially through some pseudocode like uh, LLM.complete. This is again, Llama index, but most LLM interfaces look like this. The query is what is Dora? And then you get this response without specific context. It's hard to determine what Dora refers to. And here the Dora I'm referring to is that uh, uh, modification of LoRa um, yeah, that you guys might be familiar with. But yeah, so that's essentially the motivation. And so let me just show you exactly, uh, uh, you know, a few of these examples. So from Llama Index, we're going to utilize the OpenAI LLM integration. And I'll, I'll just be using GPG-4 Turbo here. But here's a, a simple query that you might ask an LLM. So since we're, you know, obviously in the MLOps learners um, workshop, well, you know, I think a fitting question is what is MLOps in 20 words or less? So if we run that query, 
it shouldn't take too long, but here's a response anyways. It comes back with, let's see if that changes. MLOps is the practice of integrating machine learning models into production systems, emphasizing automation and monitoring in the ML lifecycle. And so where is this LLM pulling this information from? We know, I think most of us know that these LLMs have been trained on huge corpus of data, likely scraped from the, you know, the web. So whatever is publicly available has made it into its uh, training corpus. And we, you know, we train that with the typical um, language modeling task, right? Of predicting, predicting the next word, but there could be other more uh, fancy um, training objectives as well. And then I started out uh, this talk by mentioning Vector Institute. So this is just to set the table up for, um, you know, the next query, which will, uh, will, which will fail, but this one right now shouldn't. And so essentially, I'm going to prompt the, query, uh, the LLM to tell me about Vector Institute, um, and this information is generally available online through Vector's website and other uh, documents, I'm sure, but uh, here it is. I'll run it again, but you could even see it, the response here from a past run. I'll read the, the latest run here. The Vector Institute is a Canadian entity dedicated to researching on and AI, focusing on deep learning and machine learning advancements to drive innovation and economic growth. Yeah, that's a pretty good uh, statement in 30 words or less. Uh, they do have a lot of enterprise sponsorships and, you know, obviously connections to researchers. Uh, they have their own researchers that contribute to, um, you know, the, the area and submit papers, etc. Okay, so this is like LLMs are able to answer these general questions that are, again, publicly available. What about if we prompt the LLM now on say a document uh, that has just been released or recently released that perhaps made it, didn't make it into the training corpus of the, the LLM. And so what I pulled here is this uh, Vector Institute annual report PDF document. And this is available through download on Vector's website, but I'm going to posit here that uh, the LLM has not seen this document. And if the LLM has not seen this document, then any sort of queries I make against this document are not going to be um, answered in the way I, I wish for it to be answered. So here's one question. According to Vector Institute's annual report in 2022-2023, how many AI jobs were created in Ontario? Ontario being a province, for those who don't know, in Canada, where actually I reside as well. Okay, so let's run that query. And you can see already here a little spoiler unless it's gained knowledge in the last 10 minutes. It hasn't. As of my last update in September 2023, I don't have access to the specific details of Vector Institute's annual report for 2022-2023. Um, so there it is. There is, uh, you know, an illustration of the motivation of why you would use RAG, right? So again, just to recap, LLMs are trained on um, static data and it doesn't really have access to the most latest uh, documents. And so when you query an LLM uh, prompting it on, on specific knowledge from these documents, it's not uh, going to answer it unless you give it some help. Okay, I'm gonna save this query for later. Okay, so that concludes part one of the talk. Um, now move on to the second part, which is basic RAG with demo. And again, I'm, I'm just gonna continue using the Llama index code obviously here. Um, but essentially to uh, build a basic RAG, what we need to do is build an external knowledge base. So what we saw was the LLM was not able to answer that question, right? When we uh, prompted it, to, uh, sorry, queried it for, with a question specific to that vector annual report 2022-2023 document. And so what we wanna do is build an external knowledge that uh, contains those facts. So essentially contains some facts about that document. Uh, so that's step one. Step two is given a query, we want to retrieve the relevant, docu uh, relevant chunks within that uh, knowledge base uh, that is relevant to the query. So uh, Andre? Yes. Can I jump in for questions. Uh, I think it's like maybe you can just ask uh, before you go deeper and maybe on the high level use cases. Maybe a question for Lance as well. What are some of the most common use cases that you are seeing people using RAG for the Lama index and chain? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, the, some use cases that I've seen are like training documents. So, if you're uh, creating a, um, you know, a, a training sort of um, 
uh, I guess, resource for your workforce, then you might put your training documents uh, behind a reg and expose it behind a, a chat chatbot. So then your workforce can continuously ask questions about uh, the training documents or, or procedures. That's one use case. I don't know if Lance wants to offer any more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great to be here, by the way. Yeah, I, I, you know, so we actually have an internal rag system within Langchain for our documentation. That's a classic use case. Um, and actually, it should be a lot better. So it's a continuous process of actually improving the, improving the system that we dog food ourselves. Um, that is, yeah, so kind of internal technical documentation is a classic use case for RAG. Uh, we've actually seen some interesting multimodal use cases as well. Um, kind of on, on financial documentation is a really good one. I've done some work on that as well. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Within enterprises, there's a huge number of use cases related to kind of internal documentation, knowledge bases, uh, things like unstructured data, like slides is also another popular topic. Um, so yeah, we, we can talk about that all more later. Thanks, Lance. And if it's okay, Chip, I'll carry on. Cool. Okay. so. Again, three steps to the reg, build the external knowledge base, retrieve against it using a query, uh, and then augment the query uh, with the relevant documents to generate your, your response. So building the external knowledge uh, essentially involves these four level, uh, four, four steps. You load the data, chunk the data, encode the data. Encoding means give a sort of representation, numerical representation of the text sequences uh, and then store those sequences uh, in an index so that you can retrieve against that index with a, with a query. So let's go through how you do that again in, in LUM index. And just before I carry on here, I'm definitely like, this could be a, a streamlined process within Llama index or the other frameworks like Langchain as, as well, but I'm just like teasing things out just for uh, demonstration purposes here. So the first step is to load the data. And so I've got actually that data here. So if I'm, it's, it's this PDF document. So I'll load that data and you, you could see, you could take a look. This is essentially what's been pulled out after we extract it from that PDF. Okay. And then once uh, we've loaded the data, what we need to do is we need to then chunk it and code it and store it into a vector store. And this makes use of you know uh, a few abstractions in LUM index, and I won't go into too much detail, but essentially we can streamline this process using um, uh, an abstraction called the ingestion pipeline. So once we've got the the data loaded into a document, then we can apply these transformations, uh, and then essentially run a pipeline. So if you're familiar with you know pipelines in in Haystack or like even SK Learn uh, pipelines, they're they, they're similar concept. And if we look here, the transformations that we're applying are the sentence splitter, so can chunk, and then we're encoding with the open AI embedding. And then the last piece here is we're storing it into a vector store. And for this uh, demonstration, I'm just use, using QGIN vector store. It's sort of an arbitrary choice here. Llama Index also offers a, you know, in store, sorry, in memory uh, vector store that can get you up and running real quick. But yeah, so essentially, again, basic rag, step one is load the data, chunk it, encode it, and you know, store it in, into an index so that we can um, retrieve against it in step two. So let me just run this real quick. And now uh, the essentially the output of pipeline.run are the nodes. So these are now chunked and we have to chunk these documents because the LLMs have, uh, you know, finite context. And Lance has a, you know, a talk coming up on long context and, and racks. So I won't go into too much detail, but essentially we need to chunk these uh, documents so that they fit into the context of LLMs. And just for you know illustration here, you could see the text of uh, after chunking. And here it is. So uh, <laughs> create a llama index way for it, an index. So an index will essentially allow us to again uh, find the relevant documents uh, that are uh, you know related to a, a query. And so the abstraction that we're looking at here for LUM index is this vector store index. Okay, step two. So once we've built our index we've, uh, of 
you know, our facts. So essentially we've built our knowledge base. Now what we want to do is we want to retrieve against that knowledge base with a query. And so in retrieval, what we do is we take the query and we also use an encoding step, which uses the same embeddings that we did to uh, the original documents when creating a knowledge base. And then we, we take the embeddings or the numerical representation of the query and we compare it to the numerical representations or the embeddings of the facts that are stored in the knowledge base. And doing so in a numerical fashion allows us to measure uh, you know, the similarity. And so essentially what we'll do is we'll take a query, encode it in the same fashion again as the embeddings of the knowledge base, and then bring back the, the relevant chunks or the chunks that are most similar to that query. And so let's just see that in action again here. So for LUM index, what we essentially need to do is we need to create our retriever. And to go from an index to retriever is pretty simple. You just use the as retriever method. And a, you know, one of the popular parameters of retrieval is the number of you know, relevant documents that you will be bringing back against the query. And for this, I'm just sending it to two. I believe that's actually the default, but I just wanted to show you that is a parameter for retrievers. So when I run this retrieve, I'm using now that query again. That query was the one that sort of stumped that LLM, right? That said, oh, according to my last update, I don't have that information. So this is that query. So when we retrieve against that query, what we should get back are two nodes essentially. And if I now show you these retrieve nodes, it is a list and just believe me here, there, it's a list with two nodes. But essentially you can get what we call node with score. So there is a similarity score. And these are the top two nodes with the highest similarity to that query. Okay, and then real quickly, you know, generating the final response. So essentially what we wanna do in this stage is now that we've got the relevant nodes, what we need to do is augment the, that original query with the relevant documents provided to the LLM generator. So now it has a chance to answer the query that uh, you know, we asked before with the relevant facts. And for LLM index, you know, essentially the abstraction that we're using here is query engine. So again, similar to going from index to retriever, you can go to index to a query engine, which query engine to, to LLM index is what a rag is. And I just want to show you essentially the prompt uh, templates that we're using under the hood here. This is a default one. And of course, you know, it's customizable as I think it is with any sort of framework like a Haystack and uh, Langchain. But essentially what we're doing here is you know, we're getting the context information. This is the placeholder for the retrieved documents. So once we retrieve the relevant documents against that query, we will fill it in here. And then we prompt the LM further saying, given the context information and not prior knowledge, answer the query. And this is where we put the original query and we allow, we like leave this answer as blank. And so now if I ask that query, uh, you know, you already seen a sneak peek, but now it says, instead of saying, you know, I don't have the answers uh, or the knowledge to answer this question, it does spit out an answer. And so if we just take a look real quick, uh, I think it's right. Yes, here. So 20,634 AI jobs were created in Ontario. And in fact, that's essentially what the LLM is now able to spit out as well. And so that's three basic steps uh, of RAG. And, you know, I'm just gonna go through a, a little bit, a few more queries here. So according to Vector Institute's annual report, how many new AI companies were established? This one is uh, answer 27 and it's over here, 27. Uh, what about this one? What was dollar value for unrestricted net assets in years 2022 and 2023? This one, I don't think it does well. So one of the factors that you know you can, or levers you could pull to improve upon your rag is obviously how you chunk the data, uh, but also how you parse the data. So we were asking it for these two figures, our default uh, PDF parser, which is PyPDF. Um, unfortunately with that, it was not able to answer that. And Harpreet in his talk will get into you know, RAG evaluation where, you know, you definitely want to have more correct answers than not in, in a RAG build. And, you know, building beyond basic RAG, hopefully you're improving upon those evaluations as well. But uh, yeah, Harpreet will, I'm sure, shed light on that more in his talk. And then just another one here, this is just the, the sponsors 
of Vector uh, Vector Institute. I can't remember where it is. Oh yeah, there it is. Oh no. Okay, I was asking it for these ones here. And so let's see, um, VMO, Google, blah, blah, NVIDIA, Scotiabank, Shopify, and TD Bank Group. I think it missed Thomson Reuters. Um, and I think I've seen this happen a couple of times, but yeah, so um, that's a basic rag. And definitely, you know, when you're building beyond basic rag, you want it to answer these questions uh, to a higher degree of accuracy. And again, you would definitely need some good evaluation techniques and our people will touch upon that soon. So just moving along here, um, just to summarize basic rag uh, or what I've shown you. So we know that LLMs you know, are very powerful. They're used for many things from generating text, extracting text, uh, but they don't do, perform too well on knowledge in, in, intensive tasks. And, and so like, you know, when you have documents that are up, updated and you need the most relevant uh, facts, then uh, LLMs alone, or because they're not trained on those documents, won't provide you those uh, a, a good final answer. The other thing I want to point out is that context augmentation actually has been shown to outperform fine tuning. Um, and, and I think what most are sort of concluding there is that fine tuning is a good way to sort of learn the semantics or the styling of the writing. Whereas if you need specific facts, like hard facts, then context augmentation is the way to go. Um, and yeah, just to, um, you know, conclude, I've just got a few more uh, things to show here, but essentially I want to show you here what we kind of went through in, in, in terms of a message flow diagram. And so we've, we start off with a user, they've got a query, that query hits our, our retriever, the retriever then hits our external knowledge to retrieve the relevant nodes. And then, you know, we return back the relevant context with the query to the generator. And then the generator is able then to respond, uh, you know, generate the response and hopefully uh, the, the, the accurate one. And so that's essentially the RAG message flow diagram. And in my final section of this talk, I'll just have a few minutes here to touch on beyond basic RAG. So, uh, you know, with the backdrop of that message flow diagram, what I want to talk about here are like the high level success requirements for RAG. Uh, provided that you know you've got the uh, prerequisite that external knowledge database does store the facts or has the facts that it needs, there are two high level requirements. One is that you know retrieval must be able to find the most relevant documents for answering the user's question, and then the second one is that generation must be able to make good and effective use of those documents that the retrieval um, aspect is bringing back to the generator. And so essentially moving beyond basic RAG into advanced RAG really just comprises of advanced techniques or strategies that satisfy or look to address these two success requirements, either in isolation or in combination. And so I'm just uh, illustrated here, uh, and, and this is a cheat sheet I created probably in January that uh, got pretty good reception, but I can link it later. But essentially here are some uh, advanced methods that you can consider to make your retrieval uh, get better, you know, get the more relevant documents. So you can consider like a structured knowledge, you can consider attaching metadata, you can consider sliding window chunking, even some fine tuning on the embedding model. Um, and, and so those are just a few things that uh, you can do. And then here are, again, you can consider in isolation. So here are some methods that you can do to make the generation part uh, better. So again, you could sort of fine tune the generator. You can re-rank. Re-ranking is a very popular method. So when the nodes come back from the retriever, you can use a sort of classification model to get another score uh, to re-rank uh, the nodes that came back because the nodes, sorry, the context in which you the order in which you present the context to the generator does matter, in fact. <clears throat> and then here are some methods that, you know, uh, sort of uh, address both of these success requirements to simultaneously. So you've got iterative retrieval generation, you've got monolithic fine tuning, which involves the fine tuning of both generator and retriever against a common task, um, et cetera. But yeah, that's uh, essentially the end of my intro to, to RAG talk. All right.
Thank you very much. Um, we do have a few questions in the Discord. Um, maybe we can answer uh, a couple real quick and then can you uh, answer them in the Discord? Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So uh, let's go ahead and just answer the first two. What is the technical limit of the document size for uh, RAG? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that, sorry, are you asking with respect to which step, like the, the, um, the setting up the knowledge base um, or the uh, generating the LLM with the context? Because those uh, both things are. Doesn't specify, but let's do the uh, knowledge base, please. Yeah, so sorry, the question again was, can you repeat the uh, question? Technical limit of the document size. Yeah, so I, I think it's, I think it actually, to me, the, the most constraining factor here is the chunking size that uh, uh, is considered. Like you can take a full document of, you know, thousands of pages, more than that. And then what you still need to do is you need to chunk it, right? In order to provide it as context to the LLM. And again, you know, Lance will be talking about long context and, and, and RAG. But essentially, the limit here is that there's a limit on the tokens that you can provide to the LLM as part of context, right? And so that, to me, is where where the limit would be. So, in terms of chunking size, hopefully that answers your question. And uh, what type of retrieval system does LAM index use? Um, yeah, so we, we use our default one that you can use is definitely like the like an embedding vector store, typical uh, embedding. So essentially, we take our chunk documents and we have a, you know, a sentence splitter um, uh, chunker abstraction that chunks documents. And then we, you know, apply any sort of embedding that you want. Uh, for this demonstration, I showed OpenAI. But we've got obviously integrations to other uh, embedding providers, and then once you've got that vector numerical uh, vector, then you can input it into a vector store of your choosing, Pinecone, Qdrint, etc. Um, in addition to dense uh, vector representations, we also do have sparse vector representations. And then the last thing I'll also say is that we also have abstractions for knowledge uh, knowledge graph. Um, uh, uh, external knowledges, except uh, I will also say that that is currently um, being improved. So hopefully in a month or two, uh, it is actually going to be a, a significant improvement from what we've got today. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we've got quite a few more questions, but they're on the Discord. And if you've got time, can you answer a few of them? Um, yes, my pleasure, Sam. Thank you. Thanks for your attention, everyone. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's head over to Lance Martin. Uh, yes, uh, software engineer at LangChain. Um, I'll let you take the uh, take the stage. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, the questions are fantastic. Can everyone hear me? Cool. I can hear. Yeah, thanks. You. Cool. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll I'll try to address the questions. I'll try to speed through the slides and try to address as many questions as possible because there's a lot of good conversation happening. That was a really nice intro. Just one follow-up, um, I shared my slides and we do have kind of a RAG short course I did. Uh, it walks through some of the more kind of advanced techniques and bends them into these categories. Um, there's a whole bunch of tricks you can apply to RAG. I'm not gonna go into this now, but it is linked and there's a bunch of videos that accompany it. Um, today, I wanna talk about um, RAG and long context LLMs. So we kind of know that context windows are getting larger. Uh, you can kind of see on the x-axis, the estimated tokens for pre-training, in some cases we know, in other cases we don't, you know? So it's of course getting larger as well. But what's notable on the y-axis is that the context window, even for open source models, we're seeing with things like rope and self-extend, context windows are bumping out to beyond you know, 100,000 token range, which is of course on the order of, you know, hundreds of pages. And of course for certain, you know, proprietary models like Claude 3, Gemini, it's up to a million tokens. So that's thousands of pages. So a good question is like, what does this mean for RAG? And we've seen some reactions online, like is RAG dead, which I think a lot of us don't actually believe. Uh, but it's like a provocative question. And it's like interesting to think about how long context and RAG play together. 
Yeah, just as a level set, and actually, we just heard a really nice intro on this, so I'm going to speak up this for, I'll speak on this for like a second. What is RAG? It's reasoning and retrieval over chunks of retrieved information. You do indexing of documents. You retrieve them based upon relevance to a question, and then you ground a generation from the LLM on those retrieved documents. So that's the story of RAG. You just heard a really nice intro. Um, so one question I, I kind of had about this is, if long context LLM are to replace RAG, they should be able to do this too. So we should be able to retrieve facts from a corpus of say a million tokens, just as you do with RAG. So you've seen maybe some of these needle and haystack analyses come out where people basically, and you see increasingly model makers will insert a random fact somewhere in their corpus or of the context window. And then they'll ask the LLM to retrieve that particular fact. So I actually did an analysis here where I tested retrieval of multiple facts, just as you would have with RAG. And the flow is, uh, these are basically three pizza ingredients. So each one is inserted in a random location in the corpus. And I asked a question, what are the ingredients need to build the perfect pizza? And I see whether or not the LLM can retrieve them all from its context window and which ones it retrieves and which ones it doesn't. Um, so what you can see is, I observed two things. I tested GPT-4 with 120,000 tokens. So on the left here, you can see the, the fraction of correct answers. Um, now, as you scale up the number of needles, so the number of facts that I inject into the 120,000 tokens, it gets worse, um, which is kind of what you would expect. More is harder. Um, what I also saw is when you ask it to reason, so the reasoning challenge is retrieve the piece ingredients and tell me the first letter. It's also a little bit worse than just doing the retrieval, so just getting the ingredients back. So those are the two things I kind of found. But what's even a little bit more interesting is on the right, I show a heat map, and this is showing on the X different context lengths of the, the, the input context. And on the Y are the different needles. So needle one at the top is like the start of the document, and needle 10 at the bottom is basically at the end, and they're placed evenly. What I saw is basically failure to retrieve needles towards the start of context uh, and this is all GPT-4. So it's kind of like this. If you were to read a book and I ask you a question about the first chapter, you might forget. It seems that same phenomenon is happening with LLMs, at least in my tests here. Now, this is something that Greb Camerant also observed with his independent needle in the haystack testing. And I put this out on Twitter and I got some interesting responses. And some folks mentioned one challenge, one reason, maybe a recency bias in LLMs. You know, when you're attending to the next token, um, it's possible that you learn a bias to attend to recent tokens uh, when you're doing that prediction, um, which is, of course, really good for next token prediction in the way these models are trained, but not good uh, for the process of RAG retrieval. So anyway, the key point is that I don't quite trust uh, what LM providers say in terms of retrieval quality. I think uh, both the... Uh, the number of tokens you're trying to retrieve can significantly impact performance. The length of the contest can significantly impact performance. Um, and even more recently, some folks said that all these challenges may be misleadingly easy because the needles are, are very different typically than the background context. So that is all to say that when you see LLMs reporting really, really strong kind of uh, needle in the haystack retrieval, I would be skeptical. But I will still say that I'm sure it's going to get better. This is like my bad joke. Um, like, I don't think RAG is dead. I think we all don't believe RAG is dead, but yeah, I think it will change. Um, and let's like talk about some of the ways we think it may change. And this kind of relates to the prior talk in, in some nice ways. So RAG today is typically focused on precise retrieval of relevant doc chunks. So, you know, we, we saw this previously. You take documents, you typically split them. You use some split parameter. I saw some questions about chunk size. That's like always a big question. Uh, you index them, so you embed them. You take your question, you index your question, do some kind of similarity search, typically like um, you know, there's lots of different implementations here, but you're doing some kind of semantic similarity search on embedded chunks. You get relevant chunks. You might pro process them. You get them back. So what are kind of the challenges here? If you have a context window of a million tokens, like what are your options? So. I think on one extreme, people say, well, just stuff everything into context, right? So that's kind of on the right. Um, I think this is going to have a lot of problems. So for example, higher latency, higher token uses or higher cost. If you use 100,000 tokens today with GPD-4, it's around 
So I burned a lot of money doing those heat maps. I don't even want to tell Harrison, our CEO, how much I spent, but it was actually quite a bit. So basically, if you do blind context stuffing, I'm sure this will get cheap. It'll obviously get cheaper. But I think there's probably something that's going to be inefficient and and in terms of cost and latency about that approach. I think more importantly, in a production setting as well, you don't have any intermediate ability to to audit retrieval. So like if you're just context stuffing an LLM, you can't say, for example, look at the documents returned and check off like off, like security, like what users have access to what data. So in the in the enterprise context, pure context stuffing may not really be the right approach. On the other hand, I do think the current paradigm of like really precise uh, kind of chunking, just trying to get just the right context out of a corpus may also not be ideal because look, context windows are much better. You end up with lots of tricky hyperparameters like we saw before, stuff like chunk size. I've never heard a good answer to that question. I've been like doing this for like, you know, a year and a half. It's always idiosyncratic, right? So you get these re- weird idiosyncratic parameters like chunk size, um, K, how many chunks do you retrieve? So, you know, Pareto, what is like Pareto optimal? Like something in the middle here. And like, I put this out on Twitter as well. Um, you know, and, and like a lot of some reasonable taste kind of said, think about inclusion at the document level. And so what does this look like? So let me, let's talk through this a little bit. So first, I think a lot of the things that we do prior to retrieval in this like kind of document centric rag paradigm are still relevant. So things like query construction, going from text to SQL or text to cipher for graph DBs or text to metadata filters all still apply with long codex LLMs and document centric RAG. So that all is, is still present. Query analysis can still apply. Rewriting questions to be more relevant still applies. Routing still applies. So I think a lot of these like, and again, this is getting into slightly more advanced topics, but a lot of these like pre-retrieval things in RAG I never unchanged. I think these still remain really relevant. Where I think we'll see a lot of changes in the way we think about indexing. And let me show you some tricks that I've been using to do more like document-centric RAG. So this is one clever like trick that I've seen. Uh, uh, there's a really nice paper called Proposition Indexing out of Stanford. We have a, 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 a kind of abstraction for it called the multi-representation or multi-vector retriever. The big idea is, is this. I want to preserve full documents. I don't want to do any chunking in the sense that I want to preserve documents intact and pass those to my LLM. But at retrieval time, I can use other things to reference that document. So one trick I've used quite a bit, which is really nice, is take a document, have an LLM summarize it, like give me a nice crisp summary, and that's actually what this paper reports, um, and index that summary just as a reference. I do retrieval based on that summary. So I take my question, I do semantic similarity based upon the summaries of documents, and then I reference the full document at retrieval time and I pass the full document to the LLM. So it's basically a nice trick to decouple what you actually index for retrieval from what you actually pass to the LLM. So give LLM access to full documents. Don't try to play with chunking or chunk size optimization too much, um, but it's a nice way to index more compressed summaries that are easier to retrieve. So that's kind of like idea one I think is kind of interesting. Um, idea two, there's a nice paper called Raptor from Stanford as well which talked about basically uh, doing uh, clustering and summarization of similar documents to build like kind of a summary hierarchy of ideas. So the intuition here is this, some questions need to reference a single document to answer. Some questions are like higher level that require information from several documents to answer. So what this idea, what this paper showed is if I take the raw, in in that case, they did this on chunks, but I've shown this works on full documents really well, but the intuition is the same. I take similar chunk documents or chunks, I cluster them, I produce a summary of that cluster. And what, what I, at the end, I kind of go through that recursively, I build this hierarchical tree of summaries and I index them all together. So questions that are higher level will be more similar to like indexed chunks or like indexed summaries. And then questions that are lower level will, will be more similar to kind of raw documents that are present. So again, it's a way to capture information at various scales of abstraction. Um, and it can work really well with documents. So I have a, like a, a video on that and showing how that works with documents. So it's another kind of trick to do indexing at the document level to consolidate information across documents in kind of like a clean way. Um, 
Long, content, long context embeddings are also relevant when we talk about kind of document-wise indexing. So for example, if we want to just index, you know, we've talked about indexing summaries, which of course is short, but if you want to index full documents, that's also becoming increasingly feasible. Um, so there's a nice paper, again, out of Stanford, Hazy Research published um, using Mamba Mixer for uh, long context embedding, and I share the links here. So this is 32,000 token uh, retrieval, and they have, a, they have a long context benchmark. So I think there's another really interesting trend to watch. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about some things I think are interesting beyond the scope of, of the retrieval. So I think within retrieval, I think some of the trends we'll see are towards longer context, tricks to use long context, uh, both embeddings and to process full documents in place without chunking. And I've been doing a lot of work on kind of laying out different kinds of advanced RAG flows. Um, this is one pop paper that is pretty neat called self-RAG. And it reports basically, instead of thinking about RAG as like a prompt, like a naive prompt response paradigm, like I do retrieval, I feed my prompt with the documents and I do a generation. Instead of thinking about that, we can actually think about RAG as more of like a, an iterative flow where we can, pr we can use inline grading to actually do checks. Like for example, we do retrieval and then we actually check, hey, are those documents relevant uh, to my question. If they're not relevant, we can do different things. We can fall back to web search. Uh, we can rewrite the question and we can try again. Um, likewise, we can ask, is the generation, does it have hallucinations? Is it grounded in the documents? If not, we can try again. So I think moving beyond kind of a, just like a naive prompt response style rag paradigm to more of like a, a corrective or iterative rag flow is like another trend I think we'll see more of. Um, and along these lines, there's another pretty cool paper uh, called Corrective Rag. So I have a bunch of I have a bunch of videos and, and notebooks down below for this. Um, I actually showed this working with using something called what we call LangGraph. So we use LangGraph to implement these flows. In this case, we do retrieval, we grade for document relevance. Uh, I rewrite the question, I do web search if they're not relevant. So it's basically a, a, another kind of what we, I might call like kind of rag flow that moves beyond just like kind of uh, retrieval and generate. And it gives you like more control and more adaptation. This one actually have I have a video showing how I run this locally with local LMs using LangGraph, which is like a really like nice reliable way to lay out these flows. Um, and we can talk about them more if folks are interested. So again, I, I want to save a lot of time for questions, and of course the next talk. So you know the overall picture. I think thinking about kind of rag and long context LLMs. Um, so I think. Query construction, query analysis, and routing are still quite relevant in the world of long context LLMs. Um, I think indexing will change a lot. So think about indexing more at the document level than at the individual chunk level, and think about tricks to like, index full documents rather than worrying about parameters like chunk size. Um, and also we can be more aggressive about, um, we can be more aggressive about how many retrieved documents we actually pass to the LM as well. So I think that's a very important trend we can think about in terms of indexing. I also think about at like reasoning and generation, we can think more about RAG flows. And I show a bunch of examples of kind of like iterative paradigms to do grading of the documents and return, you know, and feedback if they're great, if, if they're not relevant or fall back to web search. Like we can be a lot more flexible how you think about RAG. And I think in particular a question I get a lot is what about latency? I think, with really uh, fast inference LLMs like Grok, for example, it's increasingly feasible to do these kinds of inline checks in your RAG flow. So anyway, that's kind of like my story. Um, and yeah, let's maybe just open up the questions um, and I'll, I'll try to answer as many async as well in the chat. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the time. This was really fun and really good questions. Uh, I'll just do a time check. Okay, yeah, we're, we're not, we didn't go too long. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can, we can just chat. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, so let's take a look at the questions in the Discord. Um, see, are there any techniques you recommend for retrieval when we've got millions of text chunks in the vector database? I believe this one is for you. Okay. Okay. So we've so we're talking about a case where we have a vector database with a very large number of chunks. Okay. Um, well, the typical means of retrieval is something like, you know, you're doing KNN, so you're looking for similarity. You're, you're, those chunks are, of course, embedded. You're taking your question, you're embedding it, right? Now, and you have a huge number of chunks. I think what we just talked about becomes relevant here because let's say we have an LLM with a long context, right? It, it has, for example, 
you know, a hundred thousand context window or up to a million, right? We can send a large number of chunks through. So actually I would try to avoid the case in which I have a vector DB with many, many millions of small chunks. I would again move towards, a, I would think about more of a paradigm where I try to keep my documents in place as possible. Um, and I try to preserve documents and pass full documents to my LLM, which is a lot more feasible now with longer context. Um, so that, that's maybe what I would say as point one about that. Um, but yeah, like I, if there's any more context on that particular question, I'd, I'd love to hear. Um, I don't hey. have any other. Oh, go ahead. I just want to say hi to Lance. Hey, thanks for the great yeah, talk. Great. Yeah, yeah, great to see you. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, yeah. We've been we've been emailing a lot, so it's uh very nice to see you in person. Absolutely. Yeah, I really like what you had about like breaking out the RAC uh, evaluations ecosystem. So I think we have a lot of questions on this court. I think I see a couple of people here. I wonder if we should try the new format, like maybe like if someone has a call and want to jump in, should I ask a question like Brian? Um, do you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, Lance, really great presentation. And um, thanks so much for walking through everything. I was curious about your strategy when you talked about uh, searching over documents by summaries. Uh, that's actually a really cool strategy. I hadn't like thought about that before, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, do you have any recommendations yeah. for how to store that type of data? Like if you were dealing with like, uh, like in the hundreds or, or the thousands of documents, um, how are you thinking about that? Like, is there like a go-to database that you recommend? Yeah, or yeah. How do you sort of think about that type of data uh, clustering strategy? Yeah. Okay. That's a great point. Uh, so actually we did a, so we actually did, we did a, I'll share, we did a webinar with Redis. So Redis is a really nice example of this working. So Redis will handle both like the, the document storage as well as the indexing and retrieval. So that's one, one, one approach. I have a few different approaches. Uh, one is, so like Redis is one good option. Uh, Upstash is another option that I've used for like the document storage. Um, so those are two that I've personally played with and I, I like. Uh, I think it, in general, this approach is pretty flexible because all you need is a vector store and then you need some reference between a vector store and a doc store. But Redis, we have a, we have a specific demo out of the box with this um, and, and Upstash I've used as well. And you can do it locally. One other quick point I do want to mention on this, I, I'll, I'll share these links in the chat. I have a few demos of this working in the multimodal context as well because this principle is very general. And so the idea is simply this, if you have a bunch of images I've done a lot of work with multimodal embeddings. Multimodal embeddings are kind of tricky. They're like less mature. You can take an image and you can just summarize it. So have a multimodal embed produce a summary of the image and index that image summary and then do text, basically text-based embedding search within image summaries to retrieve the right image. It's a really clever trick for multimodal rag that I saw. It really works well. I'll share some fun, I'll share some fun uh, uh, some fun demos I have on this, but it works really well, especially for cases of like. Think about like graphs, right? If you try to do multimodal embedding, look up for like figures and plots, it's like not going to work that well. They're going to, they're not going to resolve that well in like a multimodal embedding space. But if you put a text summary and then you do a search on the text summary, you can really nicely resolve like very different graphs, tables, stuff like that, which is really interesting in like kind of financial rag type use cases. I will, um, I will find some good examples of that. I'll make a note of that. Share uh, Redis seminar, share multimodal. Yeah, and uh, yeah, happy to you know, take more questions or, you know. Um, That's awesome, thank you so much. Yeah. Um. Well, I have a question then. Um, have you seen the LM Notebook uh, product by Google uh, and used it before? No, not yet. Okay. What's, um, um, yeah. So they have, you can upload a bunch of PDFs to it and perform mm -hmm. rag over it pretty much. But uh, the yeah. impressive piece to me was that they do a citation. So they generate a response in, in their chat and then they cite it in the document. I was wondering if you had like an idea of how that might have uh, how they might have done that. Yeah. Or so Lama, Lama Index has this, Langchain has things as well. Um, 
there are absolutely ways to do rag with citations. Um, so at the start here, I shared a link to rag from scratch. This is kind of a, a set of notebooks that, uh, that I made. And there's a bunch of videos that go along with this. I don't know if you can still see the screen. Um, but so I actually have some examples. I'll, I'll share this link. I have some examples of rag with citations in here. Uh, so that is well supported. Uh, rag from scratch. I'm adding this to our Discord now. That is kind of well supported, I think, in both frameworks, uh, uh, Llama Index as well as Langchain. Um, but I've not seen that, so I'd, I'd be curious to check that out. <clears throat> Yeah, and maybe also to clarify the these flows I showed, I do this all using Langgraph. Mm -hmm. We have a set of notebooks coming out tomorrow with Mistral on this. Um, this is like a whole other topic, but I think this is actually a really nice way to build a Gentic style rag um, with high reliability. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'll I have a video coming on that tomorrow with Mistral, with, and um, yeah, let me I'll share those cookbooks as well. Yeah. Um, so, go ahead, Chip. Yeah, I think we have a few other questions. So this one question is like, how is continuous training or online learning done in a RAC system? What do, what is different and what are some challenges compared to traditional ML? So it's more like continually, uh, continual learning. That's interesting. I actually haven't played with that personally. Um, Andre may have a view on that though. So I'm, I'm open to if you, if you, if you've experienced there specifically, I'd love to hear. Um, I, I saw that question too, Lance, and I, it, um, I don't think I've played with it yet, but the, my thoughts were like, you know, if, if you think about traditional ML, where you need to do continual learning, I think for RAG, one thing that needs to be continuous is the update of your documents, right? So like the facts just need to always be continuously being updated. And then, you know, related to that, I, I think. We talked about improving beyond basic rag by uh, making the retrieval uh, better and as well as the generator. So like if those two things can be fine tuned and need to be fine tuned according to your latest documents, then I think that sort of gets into a similar hemisphere of continual learning for traditional ML systems. Those are yeah. top of mind thoughts yeah. for me right now. Yeah. Seeing people using Drag as a way to like keep their LLM up to date. So like if like the cutout yeah. was like two months ago and I just input some latest information as Drag. Yeah. You know, um, um the topic oh go ahead. No, sorry, sorry. I was I was gonna say if we want to take a very quick tangent, the topic of fine-tuning versus rag is really interesting. Um that came up earlier in a question. Andre, I know you made some points there. So there's a recent paper called Raft out of Stanford that was pretty interesting on this topic. Um, I actually have not done anything with it yet. I have not done fine tune for RAG. My sense of fine tune was always, I shared some links before, kind of much better for structure, not retrieval. And there's been some good references there. Like Glean had a nice blog post talking about that. That's kind of in my working paradigm for how to think about RAG versus fine tuning. But I, I thought the Raft paper was interesting my sense is it it basically fine tunes an LLM to be better at discrimination of documents. So basically to, you know, kind of like in this flow, like we're rejecting irrelevant documents. My sense is that the raft work basically fine tuned an LLM to be more discriminating about what documents that includes. That's my sense. So it's kind of like in capturing this notion of like doc relevance filtering implicitly in the LLM. But I don't know if Andre, if you have a view on that, kind of like how fine tuning plays in with RAG. Um, the RAF work, yeah, I'm not sure if you have a, uh, any thoughts there. So on, on the RAF piece, I know, like, I personally have not gone into the paper, so unfortunately I can't comment too much, but I know that my colleague did do a, a, a Llama pack, which is just an extension um, yeah. that you can add on. So if for those who are interested, in terms of just, like, general, like, fine-tuning, um, I did have a thing to say, and now I sort of lost. Oh, right. So it, the you know the one other success requirement for RAG right is that the generator needs to be able to make effective use uh, of the documents, and you know I, I think of that as like sometimes uh, like the the knowledge or the documents stored in your external knowledge is coming from a different like source, so that's a different style from which 
the corpus uh, was used to train the generator. And so, you know, fine tuning the generator there might make sense um, on the relevant documents. And, you know, my one idea, which I haven't been able to do yet, is sort of build these LoRa adapters on types of documents that you could then sort of attach to your generators. Um, but yeah, that's much of it is like yeah. high level ideas. I haven't really gotten time to, to test them all out. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because like naive rag is basically you do retrieval, you give the LM these documents, which may or may not be relevant. LM just uses them, right? So I understand the idea of using fine tuning to build a more discriminating generator to like implicitly filter our documents. And that's also what these approaches like self rag I showed are trying to do more explicitly with checks. So yeah, it's, it's a cool theme though. Yeah. So I think like on top of that, I think that we have just got the several next coon, uh, new coon things you can do with Rack, right? Like multimodal Rack. Uh, I know that Andres answered questions on Discord about like Rack working with tabular data. And then Lance has mentioned about like maybe fine tuning to get a better retrieval. So like in general, like what are some of the things that's like the next frontiers or like next new challenges for the Rack systems? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. That's a great, that's a great topic. I think the idea of using these kind of like rag flows is really interesting. Um, so more dynamic rag system, you can kind of think about this as like rag agents. So more adaptive systems that can correct, correct poor quality retrievals, correct hallucinations, enforce answer relevance. Uh, I have another good example showing like routing to various types of data source, uh, depending on like the question type. So I think that's like one big theme. Um, multimodal rag is a great theme. Um, I did a lot on this earlier. I'll share this. So I did like a, a thing on multiple rag on um, like presentation slide decks. Um, this is where I use that like summarization and text embedding approach. Um, and it, it really did work well. Um, a bunch of companies are, are interested in this for like indexing their like multimodal content, like internal slides. Um, so I think this is a cool theme. I know, yeah, you guys at Lum Index have done some work on multimodal rag as well. Um, I think it's really interesting. I haven't seen quite as much interest yet, but I think people are kind of like, are still kind of sleeping on it. But um, I don't know if you have a view on that, Andre. We I can't hear you. Wait, can we hear Andre? I'm sorry, I have like a gating system on my mic. I've got two muting mechanisms. Uh, I was just saying that um, I, I just, agree with Lance in terms of like multimodal stuff being a little bit slept on. And um, my intuition is just that the these multimodal LLMs or whatever you call them, LMMs, are just not as up to snuff yet as LLMs. But as they do get better, I think these applications will come out more. Um, yeah. Okay, before we jump to the next speaker, and thank you, Lance and Andre, this is the interest of Tom. Before we get to hybrid, I just want you to tell everyone that so right now we have discussion on YouTube because on Zoom, Zoom and discussion on Discord, which makes it a little bit hard to follow. So I know this like a uh, Zoom discussion will like just disappear. So if you can come over to like Discord, uh, just like post the questions there. I think it's where the most conversations are happening. But cool, yeah, thank you so yep. much, Lance and Andre. Uh, yeah. So I think the next topic, we're gonna have hybrid Sahoda, uh, who is a, um, Actor in residence is Voxels 51. He also writing a book on drag and he's a really great human being and he's really like his star is on fire. So, okay, Hatbreed, I will give it to you. Hey, Peace. what's up, everybody? How you guys doing? Um, hopefully, you guys can hear me okay. And uh, hopefully, the mic doesn't give me any issues, but let's go ahead and get uh, started. Um, so, today, I'm going to be talking about rag evaluations if i could find my presentation cool so yeah like chip said i'm harpreet sahota um you can find me on twitter data science harp hacker in residence and ai ml engineer at voxel 51 i am writing a book on rag not because i'm an expert in rag or anything like that but because i want to become an expert and i figured what better way to become an expert than just do the thing a lot and write a book about it uh but we're here to talk about rag evaluation so now why do we need RAG evaluation? Um, well, for one thing, evaluation is going to give us some concrete numbers that's going to tell us how accurate our system is. It'll tell us how well the system is working, how relevant the answers are, and, and just overall how it's working. And when we have an evaluation system in place, that means we can compare different components 
of the system, right? Because a system is, is composable. We can have different prompts, different models, different chunk sizes, embedding sizes, metadata, context, so on and so forth. And having an evaluation system in place will allow us to kind of compare all these different configurations. Um, but, you know, without checking in on a RAG system's performance, it is it, impossible and difficult to, to know what needs fixing and how to improve it. Um, so just to, you know, drive the point home, uh, for the third time, we're going to overview a RAG system. Got this diagram from uh, from AI Makerspace. Shout out Chris Alexiak. Uh, if you guys don't know AI Makerspace, follow them. They're dope. Chris is dope. Uh, that's my senpai right there. Um, so what is what is a RAG system? Just again, at a high level, we create an index. We split our text into chunks and then transform them into some vector representation using some embedding model. And then we put all that stuff into an index, a vector database um, of sorts. Then we're going to retrieve some relevant context from our index when a user gives us a query uh, so that we can then uh, essentially going to turn that query into a vector using that same embedding model that we use to create our index. Then we're going to search against the vector database, find the top K results or whatever metric you're using for similarity, uh, retrieve that and put that into the, the, the context window and, and generate a response based on that. Uh, so the prompt is going to, you know, we create like a prompt template and tell the uh, LLM um, you know, here's the, here's what you're doing. Here's the context. Give us an answer, right? Um, of course, there's a lot more to it uh, than that. Um, you know, simplifying it down by a lot. There's a lot of design choices that you have to make. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of largely grouped these into, you know, uh, the, the, the framework that was in the, the, the paper that came out, um, uh, survey of RAG evaluation, uh, pre-retrieval and post-retrieval decisions. So pre-retrieval, you need to think about, okay, how am I going to parse and chunk the document? How am I going to index the document? Are we going to do like a document summary index? Are we using hierarchical uh, indices? Are we doing small to big? You know, what metadata are we going to use? What embedding model and then dimension are we going to use? What's the vector database that we're going to use? Uh, what about retrieval strategy? Are we going to use keyword-based semantic sentence window? Uh, are we going to rewrite and expand the user's query, right? There's so much more uh, than that as well. Uh, then in post retrieval, we're you know considering things like, are we going to re rank our results? We're going to filter them. We're going to compress the prompt, right? Like just the point is that there's a lot of ways the system can go wrong, um, and uh, I think of these in in two general kind of ways the system can go wrong. And that's in retrieval and in generation. So in retrieval, some of the issues that you can face is you know if if your vector database just doesn't have the necessary or up to date information. Uh, so then your system's not going to be able to fetch the relevant data for that. Uh, your retrieval algorithm might even fail just to fetch the most relevant documents because of imperfect ranking or because the search algorithm is not that good, good or, or your indexing just sucks, right? Also, you know, as the size of your data set increases, then it's going to be challenging to maintain and update this uh, knowledge base efficiently and effectively. Um, there's also, you know, the fact that you need to retrieve accurate answers from maybe some structured data that could be challenging, you know, extracting data from PDFs. Um, you know, the point is that if if there is issues in retrieval, they're going to carry over to the generation step, right? So the retrieve sources need to be relevant to the user's query. Uh, but then, you know, we also need to have a way to measure how closely the retrieved context is going to match what the user is, is asking about. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so next is problems in, in generations, right? So I'm, I'm kind of lumping augmentation and generation into one step, but basically you want the generated response to be grounded in the retrieved context. It needs to be relevant to the user's query, and it needs to adhere to any guidelines that you might have in place. But you're going to have trouble doing that if your system isn't good at generating responses that reflect the information that's in the context. Uh, if your system has trouble integrating information from multiple sources, uh, and even if the information is retrieved and consolidated, like the generation, uh, the model might just fail to, to use the generation uh, correctly. It might fail to, you know, even address all aspects of the user's query and, and give a comprehensive answer. Um, your generation might not, you know, adhere to whatever specific format request you have. Um, you know, it might not precisely match the specificity or detail that the, the, the user as is asking. Um, we also, we also need a way to, to measure the relevance of these responses right, to the retrieved context uh, and also just measure the coherence of, of this uh, 
as well. So again, begging the question, why do we need evals, right? Hopefully this is getting you thinking about why you need evals because without measuring our rank system's performance, it's difficult to know what needs fixing and how to improve it. But what are you supposed to measure? How, how do we measure a RAG system? Um, I think that in terms of quality and ability of the RAG system. So quality uh, is things like relevance and faithfulness. So relevance, um, this is you know something that should be measured for the retrieved context and the generated response. So again, the retrieved concept, context should be precise. So the more relevant each bit of retrieved context is, the better your generation is going to be. The generated answers should also be directly related to the user's query, should be relevant to the user's query. Um, and then there's the faithful, faithfulness aspect, right? So this is going to ensure that the system is generating uh, responses that are faithful, again, to that context, that the generated response shouldn't contain any contradictions or inconsistencies uh, you know, against the, the retrieved context. So when we're evaluating retrieval quality, then context relevance and, and noise robustness are going to be uh, important. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but let's just go ahead. Yeah, let's just jump to that. So, you know, we talked about measuring quality, relevance, faithfulness. Let's talk about uh, measuring uh, ability. And here in measuring ability, uh, there's a few things we look at. Noise robustness, negative rejection, information integration, and then counterfactual robustness. So noise robustness is just checking how well the model handles noisy context. So the context relate to the, you know, the, the question, but don't have helpful information. That means that it's not very robust to, to noise. Um, negative rejection is it's looking at how well the model knows when to say, I don't know. I don't know what the, the answer is. And, you know, so if the retrieved context doesn't have the information needed to answer the user's query, then the model should not respond or it should at least you know, give a refusal. Information integration. Uh, so this is you know measuring the model's ability to combine context from many different documents. So this is important for handling complex questions that require context, again, from multiple different sources. And then counterfactual robustness is just checking if the model can spot and ignore things in the retrieved context that it knows are wrong, even if it's told that there might be some misinformation in them. Um, Great. So how do we quantify these things? Uh, well, we use metrics. Which metrics do we use? Uh, these are some metrics that you can use. Uh, I'm, I'm picking metrics here from, from the Ragas library. Uh, it's just the, the library that I happen to, to use the most. Um, and there's faithfulness, answer relevancy, context precision, answer correctness, and context recall. So what is faithfulness? This is just looking at how factually accurate the answer is based on the context that the retriever found. So we want to ensure that the LLM isn't hallucinating, meaning it's not like making up plausible sounding text that's in fact inaccurate. Uh, then there's the answer relevancy, which is measuring how relevant the answer is to the user's query uh, according to that retrieved context and if it covers what the question is asking for. Then there's also context precision. Uh, so this is evaluating whether all the ground truth relevant items are present in the context and, and that they're, you know, appropriately <laughs> ranked. Uh, also, uh, answer correctness, so just measuring how accurate the generated answer is compared to the ground truth, and context recall. So this is just the number of relevant context chunks the retriever manages to retrieve compared to the total number of relevant chunks. Uh, so how do you calculate um, these metrics? Well, first, you need to have a golden data set, but I, that's a talk in itself. Uh, it's really kind of challenging and, and difficult to create a good data set, especially one for your use case. Uh, I know there's a lot of libraries out there that automate that um, process for you, but again, you want to create a data set that's gonna be specific to the application that, that you're using, right? So um, again, this is a talk in itself, but we calculate these metrics mostly using LLMs. Uh, so let's see how we do that. So here is, um, just go over a little bit of code here. This is, um, I'm working on a course with LinkedIn Learning. Uh, it's called Hands-On uh, RAG using Llama Index. Uh, so I can't share these notebooks yet because um, the course isn't released, but uh, we're just gonna take a look here quickly at, uh, at how these metrics are calculated. Um, so these are using the concept of LLM as a judge under the hood. Um, and so when we're talking about measuring faithfulness, again, we're evaluating how accurately the response is aligning with the provided context. And so there's two steps involved here. 
we're identifying statements with the uh, within an answer, and then we're going to verify that these statements uh, are correct against that context. And then we get a score out from zero to one that's going to measure the accuracy of the statements in the answer. Uh, and it's essentially this kind of uh, calculation here. Okay, but how do we get to that calculation? Uh, so there's certain steps, uh, order of operations that Ragas takes uh, under the hood. Um, so first, we're you know we're going to get a question answer pair, and then there's going to be a prompt that Ragas uses. It's called the long form answer prompt, um, and you can look into the source code and documentation for that, and we'll take a look at it here in a second as well. But essentially, this prompt is going to tell the LLM just generate one or more statements based on a given answer, uh, and we're trying to to distill the essence of the answer into some statements. Then the prompt is going to include uh, just a bunch of detailed instructions uh, specifying how to transform the answers into these statements. And again, this is going to be accompanied by examples. Uh, and then once the LLM gets this input, it's going to generate uh, output that's going to be parsed using this uh, output parser they have. And it's going to ensure that the uh, output aligns with uh, the statement answers uh, structure, which is an internal structure in, in Rogers. But essentially, here, here's the, the long form answer prompt. So uh, it, it, this is you know we're using LLM as a judge. So we give it an answer, we give it a format instruction, and we give it a few shot examples. Uh, and then we give it our actual input and output, uh, and it, it grades um, based on that. Um, so to evaluate the faithfulness, um, for example, here, after all these different statements are, are generated, uh, we're going to see whether the statements are accurate and truthful representations of the original context. Um, and so here's another prompt that we use. So under the hood, there's like just many, many prompts uh, and calls to, to OpenAI or whatever your model provider is that, that are happening. Um, but we have another NLI uh, statement message here. So again, it's just telling the LLM, uh, you know, assess each generated statement's faithfulness based on the original context. Uh, then ask the LLM to return a verdict on each one of those statements, right? Is, is the statement verifiable against the context that, that's given? And then the instruction to the LM is going to have like a detailed explanation for how the judge uh, should judge the, the faithfulness. So you can see here, it's got uh, the instruction here. You know, your task is to judge the faithfulness, so on and so forth. And uh, several few shot examples um, of context along with statements and then the score. Uh, and then finally, we inject our uh, data sets, context and, and uh, answer into that. And we finally get a score. Um, and so this score here, um, sorry, I should rerun this um, in a second, but uh, we get we get a score here. Uh, ignore this value error. Uh, we get a, we get a score, uh, and essentially it's just representing the overall faithfulness of the statements. Um, and so you could take a look, at, of course, at the source code. Um, I, I'll share some notebooks with you guys too. I have these right here in in actual uh, notebook form. I'll send the link in a second. Um, but that's it, right? So it's pretty much going through this workflow. Use an LLM to get the answer into a set of discrete statements. Evaluate each statement's faithfulness using a, another LLM prompt based on the original context. Then calculate the score, right? And then we get a faithfulness score at the end of this. And the same kind of thing is repeated for answer relevancy, context precision, uh, context correctness, and, and uh, recall as well. Um, I could go through each one of these if you guys would like, or we could pause for question, Chip. I'll, I'll see what uh, what you would like to do. I'm happy to go ahead and look through uh, the rest of this code if people are, are interested. All right. Um, yeah, we'll, we can take a look at that, I guess, just uh, one more. Um, yeah, uh, somebody wants to go through here. Great. So uh, we'll just take a look at another kind of metric here. We'll look at answer relevancy, for example, right? So again, answer relevancy using LLM as a judge under the hood. Um, so what is it doing? Measuring how directly an answer is addressing the question that's being asked. So we generate a hypothetical question from the answer, compare that to the original question, and then see how similar those are. And so we're essentially, the focus is just identifying answers that precisely address the query without going off topic. And we get out a score uh, from zero to one, higher scores indicating a closer match between the answer and the question. And then we're essentially rewarding answers that are directly applicable and penalizing uh, those that include relevant details. And so we do this calculation uh, using cosine similarity. Um, here is the formula for it. So EG right here is the embedding of the generated question. 
uh, EO is the embedding of the original question. Uh, we measure the cosine similarity, average that out um, over the number of generated questions, which in raw guess is three by default. Um, but in order for us to get there, there's a few steps that, that need to happen, right? So we're, again, using LLM as a judge. So we're prompting the LLM to do a couple of different things. Generate a question that fits the answer. Classify whether that answer is non-committal, right? Is that answer being evasive or not directly answering the question? So if, if it is, in fact, non-committal, uh, we get a zero to one flag, indicating if the answer is directly addressing the question or if it's dodging it. Uh, and we're doing this using this question gen prompt. So again, uh, this thing that we're doing for answer relevancy, uh, a couple of different uh, steps to accomplish this task, create a question that matches the answer, assess the answer's directness or relevancy. Uh, we can specify the number of answers, sorry, the number of questions that we want to generate uh, through some argument here. But essentially, we're doing this. So we give this instruction to the LLM. You know, give, generate a question for the given answer, identify if the answer is non-committal. Given non-committal is one if the answer uh, is non-committal and zero if it is committal, uh, so on and so forth, right? And give it a bunch of examples of what to do and then inject our rows data uh, into that. And from there, we're able to uh, get these scores and, and get these generated questions and, and then just compute the answer relevancy. Um, so how do we compute it? We're you know, calculating the similarity between the original and the generated questions. And we're measuring this using embeddings uh, and cosine similarity as a metric there. The relevancy of the answer is going to be determined again by how close the embedding of the original question is to those of the generated questions. Then we get a final score that's going to average the similarity across all the generated questions. Um, and note that these non-committal answers uh, lead to a penalty in the score. Um, and so it does this for uh, each row and then averages it out here. Um, and again, just to recap, uh, you know, have an original question and an answer along with our context. We're going to use the LLM to generate questions from the answer, classify whether that is committal or non-committal, then calculate the similarity between the original and the generated question. And then again, adjust based on the committal status. And we get a score for each row in that data, ranging from zero to one, uh, where one means high relevancy and zero means um, low relevancy. Um, and that's pretty much it. And, and this, this process gets uh, rinsed and repeated for, for each one of these different metrics. Um, we have some concrete way of measuring it, but really under the hood, it's you know an LLM with prompts and examples uh, judging uh, what it is that we have. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll send you guys a link real quick to a place where you can find uh, everything I was just talking about um, and get all the notebooks yourself to, to go through it. Um, but that is, uh, that's it from, from me, Chip. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Mohammed, can you ask your question or would you like me to ask the question uh, in the Zoom chat? Uh, so can users design malicious entries to mislead any of the metrics? So can users design, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, can users design malicious entries to mislead any of the metrics? I mean, you'd, I don't know if your users are creating your golden data set for you, right? So I think the golden data set that you're using to evaluate your system is gonna be created by you, not your users. Um, so I'm not sure how, how that would happen if, you know, unless I'm misunderstanding that, but I mean, uh, I'd also love to hear if, if Lancer or Andre have any uh, perspective on that, but I don't really see that as an issue when it comes to evaluation. Yeah, you'd be you'd be designing your own eval set offline. So yeah. you could take user inputs, but then you would of course scrub them and, and produce ground truth and that'd be independent from whatever users are actually inputting to your system. For online evaluators, that's maybe a different question, but for offline eval, yeah, agreed. All right, uh, we've got one. Can we use other LLMs to evaluate our RAG system? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, I use OpenAI, um, well, primarily just because, you know, 
that's what I'm used to using. Um, but yeah, you could certainly use whatever LLM uh, provided uh, that you'd like to use. And how well do you think that that works? Uh, is it better than a handcrafted metric or? Oh, uh, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, there's some metrics I like. I, I I spoke primarily towards you know the metrics found in Ravas, but I think you know you look at stuff like True Era or Aries or, or even Llama Index has their own evaluation modules. They they all kind of calculate things similar but differently. Um, I think with for retrieval, there's a lot more kind of precise metrics you can uh, calculate that are not really reliant on an LLM. Um, I guess those would be considered more handcrafted metrics. Um, but yeah, you, you definitely could, uh, and, and you probably should really create metrics that are specific to your own uh, use case that makes the most sense uh, for you. Gotcha. Uh, has anyone fine-tuned an open LLM on eval? Um, that way we can get one to, we could run offline that could do eval comparable to GPT-4 quality. Prometheus comes to mind. Um, it's like the, this an open source 13 billion parameter model that is the fine tune of Llama 2, I believe. Um, and that one, I think, is not specifically uh, fine tuned to evaluate RAG, but it is fine tuned to, to do some type of LLM as a judge thing. Uh, see, uh, can you um, expand upon Prometheus? Uh, yeah, I haven't used it uh, too much. Um, it was released, I think, um, late last year. Uh, hold on, Prometheus LLM. Uh, here it is from, oh, it's actually from uh, Cast AI. Let me pull up the, uh, the page here. Um, so Prometheus LLM, the Cast AI, the GitHub IO forward slash Prometheus. Um, and this essentially, it's supposed to be able to uh, match GPT-4 quality uh, when when used as LLM as a judge. Um, so I haven't used this uh, specifically myself, um, but you know it's, it's supposed to be really good for 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 evals. Um, so definitely worth looking into. I'll drop a link to this as well into the uh, chat here. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I can't speak too much uh, about this since I haven't really hacked around with it uh, on my own. Sounds good. Um, let's see, let's do one more. Um, what would be the best way to monitor your metrics uh, live? Uh, use Langsmith. <laughs> use Langsmith. Uh, <laughs> yes, Langsmith, there you go. Uh, shout out to, uh, to Lance there. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, the, so, so, you know, I'm writing that LinkedIn learning course and I'm writing that book on drag and part of that, uh, been having to hack around with a lot of evaluation frameworks to, to kind of monitor things. And um, I've had challenges with, with all of them, um, to be, to be honest, but the, the, the one that I've, you know, found easiest to use that is just right. Just works. Honestly, it, it, it is Langsmith. It's just, it's just easy. Um, and, and, and nice. <laughs> that, that, that would be my recommendation. Um, you know, but that being said, there's so many out there, uh, so, so many out there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, Linesmith also has support for evaluations. We're actually working on improving the docs a lot. We have integrations with Ragos, for example. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it is a pretty good choice. Um, yeah, yeah. It has a very tight yeah. integration with, with Ragos. I absolutely love it. And, and you know, the, the another thing that I really like about Lane Chain is their benchmarks framework, Lane Chain benchmarks. Um, I found that to be a really interesting uh, set of benchmarks to kind of as, you know, address agentic behavior. Um, really cool, cool stuff. Looking, looking forward to see more development on on that. All right. Well, I think that's all we've got. Uh, and if we have more questions, oh. can you go ahead? Oh, shout out to Ragas. I see Shahul is in the uh, in the chat. Yeah. Was going. <laughs> what up, man? Hey guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, you, you guys can continue. I mean, I just joined and uh, wanted to say hi. 
um yeah uh, and uh, yeah this seems to be very awesome i'll uh, i'll follow your announce in the community and uh, yeah good to see uh, guys discussing ragas yeah definitely man hey actually can i throw out one thing for shahu maybe now that you're here as well as harpeet very nice talk by the way uh one sure. thing that's been a big pain point for me is eval set generation which is like the foundation of evals yeah. always painful I met with one of the other, I think Rashik on the Ragas team, your 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 co-founder. He he made some really nice points about automated eval generation with some ideas from the Wizard of Mel paper. Someone shared it in the Discord. Do you want to speak right. on that a little bit? That's a fun idea. Sure. Yeah. Uh, as you as you mentioned, I think uh, we found out that one of the main uh, issues when it comes to evaluating Rags is that the first road blocker developer faces is the lack of uh, proper test data set and. Uh, so what we de did there is to uh, come up with an algorithm uh, um, uh, uh, from some of the papers like VisaDML to uh, generate questions or generate question and answer pairs from any set of documents that you can plug in. And uh, these question and answer pairs uh, will be high, highly diverse and of high quality. So uh, the challenge when uh, generating synthetic data from documents in a question and answer uh, pair form is that the uh, questions will be very naive and simple and it will follow a similar structure because LLMs are trying to converge and not to diverge. Uh, so the challenge here is to generate divergent and uh, high quality questions. And uh, for that, we came up with this algorithm uh, that uh, we use underneath. It's called Raga's tested generation. So you, you basically can come up with any set of uh, documents and get high quality and diverse questions from it. Uh, I can drop uh, the documentation here. Uh, but this is something uh, this is something for which we also released one of our custom models for because we saw that uh, the question generation powered by GPT-4 and the combination of GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 is getting very expensive and we also fine-tuned a smaller model to replace GPT-4 for, for this particular instance. Uh, I can share those resources right here and also in the community so you, get, you guys can and get started. Yeah, definitely gets super expensive. Uh, and Bikram makes a good point here. Uh, you time out on OpenAI quite quickly because uh, you get 160,000 tokens per minute. And I was surprised how quickly you can run into that. I mean, but I'll, I'll just share kind of what I, what I was doing for like, so so the the premise of my LinkedIn learning course is just hands-on uh, RAG using Llama Index. And, you know, I'm, I'm using a, a corpus of data here. Like I'm trying to build like a virtual mentor. So I got books by Naval Ravikant, Balaji Srinivas, and uh, Paul Graham, you know, Seneca and, and Nassim Taleb. And I, I think about the way I am going to be interacting with my virtual mentor. And the way I'm interacting with the virtual mentor is like, I'm going to be asking questions specific to, you know, issues and challenges that I'm, I'm facing with my life uh, or, you know, whatever it is, is in front of me. Um, and the questions I saw generated from, you know, for example, for, from Ragas or from Llama Index's uh, data set generator um, was, they're good questions, but they weren't the way I would be interacting with my system. Um, and so- It's I, three o'clock. I, I found that a lot of it is, you know, good yeah. prompt uh, engineering. So, you know, uh you're there's not even prompt engineering just writing a prompt uh just saying hey you know you you have to write a question given context must be in the form of an adult mentee seeking advice formulate it in the same style uh, as a user in a search engine you know so on and so forth uh, and the same thing here with the uh with the answer and um i mean overall i was that i don't know if it's still here or not but it ended up being quite uh quite decent i didn't to do it but uh it ended up being quite decent and i, I think for you know for the purposes of the course that that I'm doing here for for LinkedIn Learning, it, it worked nice. It was simple, easy to use, and and quite cheap. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, customization actually, I think is key. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I think you made a very good point there regarding the uh, nature of the generated questions in all these in the uh, UL, uh, data generation. So that will be a next step for us uh, as to so the the there the feature would be something like you could come up with. A hundred or twenty or you know x number of questions that you actually see in your production environment and synthesize questions that are very similar to that uh, particular distribution. Uh, for this, we would need a little more customization and uh, more access to weights because it, it needs a certain change, a certain kind of preference change in the model itself. And sometimes, uh, but this is something which we are actively working towards. 
so that this is something very valuable for uh, enterprises too um so yeah uh, excited excited to uh, know that you also noticed this particular issue and uh, yeah well, well thank you everybody uh, i know we're getting over i'll hand it back over to, to chip uh shout out to lance andre for great presentations uh, as well yeah I, I watch another host sam was a host uh thank you so much everyone for coming and please uh yeah thanks uh sam for hosting thanks uh lance andre and Habrit for presenting and thanks everyone for the great discussion. I've been really enjoying the discussion on Discord. So yeah, head over to our Discord if you have more questions and want to catch up and let's do more fun events again in the future. We will sure, be thanks, posting yeah. the links for the presentations on YouTube and on Discord. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks all. That was fun. Thanks. See ya. Yep. Thank you everyone.